Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, on behalf of Gravitas, I'd like to welcome the, uh, the Can America team, um, Dan Anglin and uh, Frank Faulkner. I'm really excited. Uh, we've been on the road the past, uh, the past week, so lots going on. Um, they own a portfolio of uh, U.S. Canna cannabis brands uh, in the U.S., in Maryland, Nevada, and Colorado. I'll let uh, Dan kick things off, and then we can take questions and answers after. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Dan Anglin, CEO, co-founder of Can America Brands Corporation. Um, as you can see on our cover page of our uh, deck, we've got an exciting branding company that also does exciting product lines in the U.S. Uh, space of cannabis, as well as you know exciting um, and very poignant slogans, all of which are currently being registered as trademarks and copyright. Uh, in both the United States and, and Canada. Uh, the company was founded in 2015, and we began sales in the space of edibles in the state of Colorado in 2016. In our first quarter of sales, we became the number one selling gummy company in the state of Colorado. Um, my background, um, which helped, uh, as well as Frank's background, helped us launch this new brand in the middle of recreational space so, so well was that um, I was one of the first cannabis branded uh, companies licensed in the world. In fact, our first company was licensed 00001. Um, and in that space, we had branded products um, of, under Edipure, and Edipure did very well as the only cannabis manufacturer in the state of Colorado. The current space in Colorado is there's over 200 companies that are making confections, including gummies, um, and yet we're still a top 10 brand, which is very difficult given the fact that uh, we only started the company in 2015 and started gummy sales in 2016, so two years after recreational began. And that's really because of our experience in both uh, sales, distribution, manufacturing, cultivation, and retail. I've been licensed 38 times uh, throughout Colorado and the United States. Um, and what's important is that we've moved from a licensed operator to a branding company that is an intellectual property company. Um, I was here in 2016 attempting to raise private equity for my company down in Colorado. It was a very difficult time. Uh, the Canadian investment market uh, wasn't ready for U.S. operators. And so since being here and, and having that experience of people being excited about what we do but not yet ready to invest, we created a better opportunity for uh, investments here in, in Canada and for our opportunity to be uh, listed on the CSE is, as you can see on the cover page, our CSE ticker is C-A-N-A, -A, which will be available on the market on Monday, two days prior to recreational sales beginning, so timing is everything. Um, we'll go through the deck uh, page by page so that everybody understands what the offering is and uh, then we'll have time for questions <laughs> afterwards. Uh, so right here on um, the statement page, oh, thank you, which one is it? Down. Perfect. So right here on the statement page, what it does is it explains the licensing model of the business. Um, and what that means is, is instead of going through the trouble to create brick and mortar operations in every market because in the United States every state is a different regulated market that requires sales within the borders of that state. It's a very expensive way to try to expand. So we created our intellectual property company so that we could then license to current operators their right to manufacture and distribute our products under our brand. And what that does for operators who've gone through the trouble of getting a license to operate in, in the cannabis space, getting the very expensive real estate, building their infrastructure, doing all of the things that cost so much to be in this business, instead of also having to figure out how to market and brand, what they can do is they can become a licensee of the Can America Branding Corporation and enjoy the opportunity to have what's already an established brand in multiple states 
and established sales and distribution of multiple types of products. Confections, where they are allowed, are primarily the number one selling product in those marketplaces. In Colorado, edibles have overtaken flower sales, which is bud and trim and, and pre-rolled joints, uh, simply because uh, the consumers really gravitate to that vertical. And in that vertical, gummies are the number one seller in the edibles <coughs> category. Chocolates are very popular, but there's something about gummies that virtually every part of the demographic can, can relate to and wants to purchase. Um, so what we bring to these companies that have created their own opportunity to be in the cannabis space is a real solution for high scale, large volume sales, top line sales in the, the vertical that makes the most sense. In states where there are no edibles, uh, we do concentrates, oil products, uh, vaporizer pens, we're developing more products based on consumer response in those states. And as we go through the deck, you'll see what I'm talking about. So the executive summary, I'm clearly going the wrong way. Uh, we've raised 5.4 million to date on this offering. Um, and what we'll be doing with um, that 5.4 million is we'll see how the stock progresses and come back and do another raise in a couple of weeks so that we can begin doing the second part of the business plan, which is brand acquisition for um, other brands to be under the umbrella of Can America Brand Corporation and have that market expansion into these other markets that we're already in and also expand Can America products into markets that they're in that we're not yet in. Um, so, you know, under uh, our portfolio is Americana, Can America, Live Labs, uh, primarily Can America is now the product line that the consumers really recognize and understand and we um, have trademarked uh, all of those brands that we currently own um, and we're looking forward to bringing Can America into markets like Michigan, California and hopefully Canada as the regulations allow for more product lines uh, here within the next year. Um, our story and our iconography and why our brand is so well uh, recognized in the United States is that I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And so we wanted to capitalize on that patriotic feeling of freedom, of the end of prohibition. I've been telling people I meet in Canada that I'm surprised there aren't million man marches planned for next week. Uh, I think on January 1, in Colorado, we had about a million people who were consuming cannabis on the lawn of the state capitol, and I believe Seattle had very similar parties. And so I'll be back next week, and I hope to see somebody celebrating because it really is the end of prohibition. Um, and that's what we have really created our brand around is that feeling of new freedom, uh, of the legality of either medicinal choices in medical only markets or other choices for adult use in recreational marketplaces. We've also created a reputation of top, top shelf oil. So uh, our science, the, the way the history of our company worked is we really focused on policy first at the beginning because the rules were all being made and one of the reasons why I entered the space is that um, it was uh, made sense for someone with 10 plus years experience in political advocacy to be in the space uh, simply because as the rules were being made many people wanted to create restrictions and prohibitions and so in order to protect the industry and protect the interests of my original company it made sense to bring somebody with political activities into this so what we wanted to do as we focused on the policy was then focus on the science and really kind of understand what can be done with cannabinoids and what can be done with the plant. Um, and as we matured in our uh, science of extraction, we really developed a sense that the consumers wanted clean oil in their products. So we were the very first company, Can America, to put what's known as distillate, which is a clean and clear oil, into a food product. Because primarily what businesses were doing to save money was putting what's known as 
food grade oil into products, which is a lower quality, much more compounds of the plant. And so by finding the right ingredients for our food products and utilizing clean and clear oil, we developed consumer confidence in our brand because of the consistency of our science and the quality of our product. Um, again, utilizing my experience in the United States Marine Corps and just kind of that feeling in the United States of the end of prohibition, all of our branding was really focused around being free and your freedom to, cho to choose. We use slogans like, be free, brand of the free, uh, uh, taste the freedom, and all of these things really resonated with consumers quite well. So uh, all of these experiences combined is what really shot us to the top and kept us at the top in our vertical in the state of Colorado. Opportunity in the United States, of course, everybody who's been looking at this space, this map changes all the time. Uh, Oklahoma will, will be added here at the end of the year. Michigan is uh, bound to go recreational here in less than a month as far as approval from the, from the people in the state of Michigan. And uh, I could spend all day naming each state that is uh, making medical or medical rec or rec only um, legal. And so there's just an endless opportunity in the United States as well as here in Canada once they figure out uh, their final regulations on products. So how does Can America and um, people who have licenses work? So the strategy is that this is a royalty based per unit fee uh, relationship. What we've done is we've created the supply chain for packaging, we've created the supply chain for hardware, and we've created the supply chain for substrate. Um, in the edible space, we have developed a science that allows us to externally soak with precision dose each piece. So imagine that if you had a limit of 10 chocolate chips per candy by law, and you had 100 chocolate chips and you tried to put those into a bowl and you had an expectation that you would get 10 chocolate chips per candy clearly or per cookie clearly that's not going to happen 100 percent of the time so we developed science that allows us to do metered dosing through laboratory equipment so that it maintains the exact and precise requirement in whatever that regulatory space is additionally it allows us to look at microdosing based on uh, consumer desire for smaller doses and so in 2019 we intend to launch a cookie line that's microdosed of either half a milligram milligram or two milligrams per so that those people who really enjoy the cookies can eat as many as they want without experiencing too much efficacy um, the way that the licensing structure works so far is that each of the three states that we're in have a, a roughly the same amount of population, six and a half million to seven million. So what we've established in our business is that one distributor can handle population of that size. So geographically, um, we only have one licensee in the state of Colorado, the state of Nevada, and the state of Maryland. When we get to California, we may have more than one based on their ability to distribute. Uh, but again, we vet each licensee for how well they're capitalized, what their infrastructure is, how well their compliance has been to date. Um, and if they're a new licensee that has no performance, their capitalization and their management team are extremely important in order to be able to make a decision to license with that group. Um, the other portion of the expansion is every brand that we acquire will also be uh, an opportunity for those licensees to d manufacture and distribute those brands. And we'll explain the royalty section on brand acquisitions as we go. Um, what that agreement does is it grants the licensee the right to be the manufacturer and the distributor of any products under our umbrella. And what we provide to them, I just want to make sure I'm uh, staying on, on uh, deck, what we provide to them is equipment, know-how, SOPs, branding, packaging, um, substrate, and hardware. And so the uh, per unit price, which is, let's make sure we're in section two of our licensees where it reflects the difference in the per unit price based on the wholesale price in each market. Um, the per unit price is very reasonable. 
um, with what it covers for that manufacturer. So in Colorado, TR Scientific is our licensee. You'll see that the uh, per unit price that we charge is $2.17. The average wholesale price is $9.65. Um, and why I say there's an average is because it's based on volume. If a dispensary is purchasing on the wholesale level more than 500 bottles per week, then they get a price of $9 per unit. Um, not all dispensaries can manage that much volume because the, some are small and some are very large. Um, but uh, based on the average unit price, what you can see is most dispensaries are purchasing thousands of units of these per week for sale in their dispensary. The average retail price really depends on location in the state of Colorado. If it's downtown Denver, it's between $14 and $16. If it's up in the mountains of Aspen, it can be as high as 30 bucks a piece, and that's primarily because of delivery fees. Um, you know, the uh, forecasted data is that um, TR Scientific will likely make 3.9 to 4.2 top line sales on this, and that's with a requirement under the agreement that they sell 40,000 units per month, which is a reasonable minimum, seeing as how we were selling 65,000 units on average per month when we ran and operated the company ourselves. Um, so what we've done is we've given them a minimum that allows for you know, more competition in the space and yet still maintain the minimum of expected uh, growth and revenue for our company. Moving to Nevada, Nevada just started five weeks ago uh, distributing into the marketplace. They're experiencing extreme interest um, to the point where they can't fill enough orders, so they're going to have to increase their infrastructure to be able to handle um, the amount of interest that there is in the brand. You'll see that this uh, per unit price is higher, so it's really dependent on the wholesale price in that individual market. In Nevada, it's averaging about $12.75 per unit. Um, and we have multiple offerings in Nevada. These bags that you see on this slide are three-piece bags um, that are being sold at four bucks wholesale um, and typically about 12 to 15 bucks retail. And why those are popular is because nobody wants to walk around the casino with a big bottle in their pocket. So they'd much rather buy a bag of three pieces and then they can share with their friends or consume however they want. And if they have any left over, it fits in their pocket. Um, so we have the ability in these markets to basically service every need and as the licensee learns more about their markets, we'll adapt and create other products for them to be able to sell in those uh, specific markets. Maryland is a bit different because, um, and I am on page 12, um, edibles are not allowed and so this licensee r obtained a license and had no experience in cannabis and no experience managing a small business. So this relationship, we traded equipment and expertise for 10% ownership of this business. Um, we still don't touch the plant in this business. All we did is we trained them and provided them with equipment. And in this market, which just started selling last Friday, they're also selling everything that they make. And what they're making there is vapor pens, disposable C cells, um, different methods of oil that can be smoked, wax and shatter, and other products. And our new products that we'll be um, introducing in the next calendar year will be capsules, inhalers, uh, anything else that the market is really uh, interested in getting. And what we wanted to do by being in Maryland is to prove that the brand wasn't just associated with gummies. So while our margins and our top line volumes are better in the edible space, we wanted to be in this space simply for the fact that not all markets have edibles and we wanted to show that the brand itself was strong no matter what market it was in. Um, You'll see on page 13, the current portfolio is Colorado, Nevada, and Maryland. And why we've just said new state, new state, new state is because things change all the time. While we're very excited about California, Michigan has 380,000 
current medical patients and going recreational, 13 million people in that state. We think that many Illinois uh, recreational wishers will travel to Michigan to make purchases. We think the same thing will happen in Ohio. Um, so we see that Michigan is a very intense marketplace of immediate sales and they're structuring their regulations just like Colorado, meaning that it's not a loose space system and so because we've had success in Colorado and we like the regulations that were created in Colorado, uh, we have a lot of hope for Michigan. Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, et cetera, our uh, plan is to be in every one of those marketplaces, but of course we want to make our initial investments into the space something that gives us that return. And so speaking of investments, brand acquisitions, and um, oh, I'm sorry, I, uh, one more slide. Planned licensee rollout, that's what I was talking about. So, you know, we've highlighted some states that look good, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, but every day the landscape changes in the United States of which market looks better. So uh, the only way we can really manage this is to set these up and um, really anticipate that it takes about six to 12 weeks to get each licensee ready for sales. So we want to manage those effectively so that they're, when they're ready for sales, the brand launch is appropriate and the successful uh, um, entry into the marketplace is real. So I, I basically would have liked to just paint the whole country red and say that's our planned rollout because that's truly what we're trying to do. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Frank Falconer, our Chief Operating Officer, my business partner, and he'll talk about brand acquisitions. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you everybody for attending today. We appreciate your time. Um, just to give you a brief background of my history in the industry, I started in 2009 with one of the first uh, processor licenses, started a company, uh, sold that, and my main role in the company since then has been sales, distribution, uh, biz dev. I've worked with multiple companies, and uh, my true passion in the cannabis industry has been to build a national brand that can cross borders. So, um, as Dan was mentioning before, we've you know had a major focus in Colorado of owning licenses, um, producing our own product, having over 40 employees. Uh, this model just made sense for, sense to us. We just wanted to create a model where we were thin, but we were a brand, and we had the ability to talk to people in Canada and all over the world about you know introducing that brand and different products underneath our umbrella as more of a national brand. So, uh, going on to the brand acquisition pipeline. Um, slide. Slide. Oh, slide. Sorry about that. So, looking at this slide here. So, um, one way I like to, or an example that I like to use in explaining our our kind of business strategy and acquisition models, uh, a company like Coca Cola. So, Coca Cola has its brand. That brand holds different. Uh, brands like High C, Dasani, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of different bottling brands underneath that umbrella. And then they have their bottling facility that manages production, sales, distribution. That's a good way to think about kind of our next step into the brand acquisition part of our business. Um, obviously, moving into new states um, and expanding our footprint is very important. Um, but the second stage of, of development is truly in the brands that we hold and taking a clip off those brands and just owning those brands. The model isn't to own their operation, uh, their day-to-day -day business. The model is to basically own those brands and take a percentage of their sales on the top line through acquiring them and introducing those to through our footprint uh, nationally and internationally. So uh, a good example of this is uh, POTA brand acquisition. Uh, POTA is a very exciting company to us because it's a unique niche. There's nothing like it in Colorado or in the states in general. Uh, POTA is a zero cleaning system, meaning that uh, the device itself doesn't smell like cannabis. It's a very uh, clean device. And uh, the actual compo uh, compostable dry herbs pod itself is biodegradable, it's disposable, and it's one of these products that just, just doesn't, simply doesn't exist on the market. Sorry, I keep missing that. Um, and we're really excited about this opportunity. So. Um, it was uh, it, with Invictus MD in the past. It'll be rolled out of that company and then rolled 
underneath the Can America brands um, umbrella, and we're really excited to have that uh, have access to the brand not only in the states but also in Canada. We think that that product in itself will be very popular here because um, it's an herb product. It's not limited by oil and vaporization. Um, it's a product that can really take off here in this space. Um, going on to other brands, uh, you know, we do own 30% of FGM processing. That's a licensee in Maryland. We have an opportunity, or we own 10% currently. We have an opportunity to own 30% of that license. Hemp America is a brand that is strictly focused on the CBD side of the space. Uh, we're in R&D currently uh, with a major gummy manufacturer and receive products back. The CBD side of the entire industry is really exciting to us because we're not limited by state to state regulations. We can cross you know, state and international borders with these products and we expect a, a huge upside on, on these brand acquisitions. So um, that company uh, is intended to be called Hemp America and expand, expand that side of our business. Uh, moving on to the financial information on slide 19. Um, you wrote the real, true strength uh, in this model is uh, in the brands. It's the royalty model, um, low overhead, um, you know, we, before we had 40 staff members, we had eight licenses, we had to pay all types of fees that are associated with just only licenses in Colorado. Um, now we're very thin. We have a total of five employees, very low overhead, um, and we don't have the operational and, and licensing costs and taxes that are associated with it. We actually are able, we're, because of our model now, we don't have to pay the 280E tax, which is a a very heavy tax that all licensees in the business have to pay because it's federally illegal in the United States. Um, you know, going into you know the historical and projected income statement. So when you look at the four million and the five point two million uh, U.S. dollars, that was focused on our old model, our own br old brand Americana. Uh, that was with all the large overhead that was assumed by our business and. Uh, this year is when we made the transition from, you know, owning those licenses and being involved in those licenses to really just owning the brand and working with our licensees to help them be successful in each state. Um, going through, um, you know, this 2018 data, you know, it is truly, um, you know, focused on this new model and the more we grow it and the more brands that we bring underneath um, our umbrella, um, this will add up. This is, tr this is focused on the Can America brand and the different SKUs that are placed underneath it currently. Um, and these projections don't include other brand acquisitions, other products like the CBD line, Hoda, and all these other um, brand acquisitions that we currently are looking into. So moving on to the next page, uh, the cap table. Um, so there's 49.6 million shares outstanding. Most uh, recent financing is at 15 million. Um, 17 million free trading. You know, the 17 million is consisted of friends, partners, family. Um, you know, we, we have a very tight structure here, so um, it's somewhat, I think, unusual in this space to, to have it this tight. Um, but that's the way that's been created from the beginning. No RTO. Um, you know, this is kind of an organic listing where we've created this on, on our own. Um, and so, you know, it's just a non-offering play. We're in the future, so we're out here just basically building brand awareness about the stock going live on Monday. Um, we think the timing behind the stock is ideal with the federal legalization going live on the 17th. And we're just going to give the market some time to kind of adapt to our, our company and see where the stock lands and then we're going to push for a 15 to 20 million dollar raise in about two to three weeks. So uh, we can go through the rest of the deck together here. Okay, so that's the formal presentation, right? right? I, think, <laughs> I think the thing that's exciting here is that what we've got is we've got an intellectual property company that has the legit legitimacy of our eight years of being in this industry and our three years of actually selling these products in a regulated space. So, you know, what's really helpful for our expansion is that because we've been involved in this for so long and we've been so public, so highlighted in this space, 
we have relationships in virtually every state that's either online now, coming online, or just have been contacted by people who are ready for their state to come online and they're excited about the brand. So, um, you know, as far as the cap table goes, I think the piece that's really important to understand is we did this on a paper deal when we did the acquisition. We're locked up, Frank and I, for three years. So this is about building a company. This isn't about cashing in on our experience. And I think with, you know, the very small amount that's been locked up for the Series A and the Series C, like this is, this is something that most of you probably haven't seen in this space. Um, as far as what the opportunities are to get involved in, in a cannabis brand. So I think with that, let's yeah. take some questions, either from the internet or from the room, or we're, we're not typically this dry. I think it's just <laughs> because of the presentation. Okay, Frank, you that just yeah. I've heard the story. So there is no warehouse. So as a licensee, this gets shipped to me. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. So no we warehouse. don't store packaging. We don't store labels. We don't store candy. Right. We do store equipment that's ready for the next licensee. But what we do, so we control the supply chain. We also work directly with the people who make our packaging. So not just some third party packaging processor. And that's really what our advantage is in this company, is that we can create these orders and drop ship them directly to whomever, Nevada, Maryland, California, Canada. And so our company doesn't need the brick and mortar of a warehouse for 70 pallets of candy that are coming in and trying to distribute those things, which is why we don't need that infrastructure. We will be boosting our infrastructure as interest in this goes along on the management side so that we can effectively manage our relationships with our licensees. It's a lot of fast moving things, new products all the time, competition is coming. So in order for us to appropriately support our licensees, through marketing and all these things, we need a couple of more folks that are focused on that, a national sales manager, national procurement manager. But again, we're not talking about building a 200-person company because it's not necessary. When you uh, uh, acquire these brands, I know you don't want to get involved with the operations and all of that, but are you still acquiring the operation part of the company as well, right? Like so that's a very interesting question, right? Because that's typically what all these cannabis deals that have been coming up to Canada are about, right? Is equity in the company. So basically what we're talking about doing is infusing money into a cannabis company that needs it without taking equity from them. So now it's a royalty play. So if it's Joe's Cannabis Company, what I've bought is Joe's Cannabis Company, the name. You pay me 20% now for the right to use your name on your distribution until your note's paid off, and then it's 10% clip on it in perpetuity from there. So what we're really talking about is infusing capital into cannabis companies that too many people for far too long have been afraid to infuse without any strings attached. And if somebody would have come to me two years ago with that offer, I'd have taken it in a second. Sure, I'll pay you 20% for two years off my top line sales and you don't want to take my company because where cannabis companies are is they're so protective of what they think their value is, right? Whether it's they've invented some, some process or whether it's they've invented something else. And truly as this thing continues to grow, the values are in the brands. So we want to have, what's that company, AGC? Authentic Brands Group. Authentic so Brands Group. We're modeled after Authentic Brands Group. They own Prince, they own Nautica, they own Tap Out, Vision Street. Juicy Wear. Couture, Nine West. brands, but yeah. they don't own the brick and mortar. They don't have the responsibility of the manufacturing side. They don't have all the employees. I think there's 150 people in that office, but they take a clip off of top line sales uh, for each brand. So they own the brand and how the brand is represented in the market. So that's the, that's the model. And brands are where the consumers place their confidence, right? Most consumers don't understand the science behind it. They just trust a brand has figured it out and they're operating properly. And whatever it is they're going to consume is safe for them to consume. And that happens through the brand, which is why, of course, we're not just going to buy any brand that exists so that we can put them under our umbrella. What we want to do is buy meaningful brands so that Can America Brands Corp can become normal North America's trusted cannabis brand, right? And hopefully, internationally, um, we're we're hopeful that, right. that it'll be it'll be you know received very well in Europe. Um, but 
again, we, we're not quite sure because they're not quite sure what they're doing yet. In, in such a, a, a unique space, I mean, we've been doing it for almost 10 years now, but as, it's, as it grows, it's so important to have the consumer be able to relate with a brand, and we want to be able to control that messaging and make sure that it's correct and we build these unique brands that we find appropriately. Here's what happens in these emerging markets. People buy everything, right? And they walk into a store, they've got $300 in cash, and they're like, what can I have for $300? And they want something of everything. As the market matures, they start to identify brands and product lines that they enjoy and that they trust. And I think that's really where this entire market goes. It happened in Colorado in less than four years, right? I mean, that's, that's just an instant in the way a new industry comes up. Um, so I think what we're going to see is maturing markets much quicker than that in places like Vegas. Of course, it's already happening in California. But every time a new market comes online, if they see brands that they've seen when they've traveled for cannabis tourism, they're definitely going to gravitate towards those brands. And that's what we've proven in the markets that we've already entered. So great question. More questions. You mentioned that you use a clear oil distillate uh, into the gummies and that you have specific technology that allows you to control the dose uh, very <coughs> specifically. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on that and how you get it into the gummies or? That would require that you and I sign an agreement that you are going to be a distributor of my intellectual property. So what that is, is that's laboratory grade equipment that utilizes standard pharmaceutical technology that anybody who's familiar with metered dosing would be able to identify, right? So metered dosing is not a new technology in, in pharmacology, but it's definitely a new technology in cannabis. And that's part of the beauty. That's what you receive as a as a licensee is you are granted our trade secrets. So but, I'm sure everybody wants to know it, but I, yeah, again. But distillate, <laughs> distillate, distillate's very, not a very secret. Common. I mean, yeah. you can go on the internet and learn how to make distillate. So when you think of distillate, you think of distilled alcohol, right? We're cleaning all the impurities out and then we're stripping terpenes out and then reintroducing those terpenes so we get the indica sativa hybrid attributes of the plant. So that's easy. I mean, the, yeah. the, the IPs and how we dose it, um, the key is we do use laboratory grade equipment and it's microdosed and it's the most effective way that we've found to, to create a project that's hom homogenous, meaning equal all around and very accurately dosed. And, and as far as distillate goes, what our preference is, is hydrocarbon extraction because it leaves most of the compounds within the oil itself. Some uh, regulatory marketplaces are very concerned about hydrocarbon extraction or BHO as you're probably more familiar with it. However, we're proving on a daily basis that hydrocarbon is safer than nail salons. And um, you know, with CO2 extraction, you have to do a lot more terpene reintroductions because it takes everything out. Now I'm talking science, so if I'm speaking Greek, just let me know, but what, CO2 strips everything but THCAs and THCVs, so then everything else, all the other compounds have to be reintroduced. With, with hydrocarbon, it's basically just stripping all of the compounds out of the plant material and it creates this black goop that then needs to be more processed. And so that is exactly what we're looking for in our distillation process so that we don't have to continue to reintroduce terpenes other than to make it genome specific. And what that means is indica specific, um, sativa specific, or hybrid with CBD added to it as well. And again, I, the science is, uh, we could talk all day. <laughs> so, sorry, Dan. Right, yes. Can you just clarify as well, so 5.4 million is being raised privately till t today, and then on Monday it's a non is it Non that is exactly right. So we're not making an ask for um, any type of investment other than just trying to create awareness in the ticker C-A-N-A -A, um, because then we're going to come back and try to raise 15, 20, 30, whatever millions that we can raise based on the performance of the stock in the next couple of weeks so that we can then turn right around and start the brand acquisition process. Um, and really ramp up, you know, the infrastructure for getting the brand into every market that we can get into as soon as possible. We're only limited by time. I have a question. It yes. It may not be necessarily applicable to you, but uh, 
um, if somebody wanted to buy this product or any other product that you would get at a dispensary, and for instance, uh, in the state of Michigan, once I guess it goes legal, uh, and if there is cross-border uh, people that are going across the border to, to buy the products that are coming from the state where it's not licensed or legalized at that point, what is the, uh, the obligation of the vendor at the dispensary? Uh, is, is it a, a, a general identification process? So if I showed my driver's license that said it showed a, 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 an Illinois are they allowed to sell that product? It depends on the state. In Colorado, anyone in the world can come and purchase cannabis in Colorado. The responsibility for you not to break federal or international law by leaving a state that's legal rests on the consumer. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that Ohio and Illinois residents are going to do what's known as can of tourism. So they're going to go to Kalamazoo, spend a weekend in Kalamazoo instead of at home and enjoy consumption of products in Michigan and then go home and tell everybody how great it is to be able to walk into a store and legally purchase. Canada is going to see this hopefully as well when you have more products than you're currently offering now because that's what consumers are looking for, is as many products as we can think of. They want to see and taste and smell and smoke and consume it all. Uh, but taking it home is not encouraged by anybody in the space, not by the retailers, not by the manufacturers, not by responsible vendors. It's uh, more of a case of let's push our regulators and politicians to do what Canada did and make it legal nationally so that people don't have to be put into a position of potentially breaking the law by accident by having that product in their bags when they travel back home or their car when they travel back home. Canada tourism was alive and well in Colorado and has been since 2014. Uh, I mean, there's buses that'll drive you around Denver and let you go to dispensaries and consume and. Uh, but no one's promoting taking any of these things home. The reality is people will come from these bordering states and come and enjoy it and consume it um, and then hopefully go home and tell their local politician it's time for you to do something so that I can enjoy this as well because it's a travesty that people in California and Colorado and Washington and Oregon can do this and I can't because I'm in Indiana. What has that got to do with anything? Nothing. Right, so it's a great question, but it's, it's the responsibility of the uh, consumer. And my second question, which is generally one of my favorite questions for U.S. cannabis companies, is uh, uh, do you have any issues with your, your commercial banking relationships right now? Oh, we did, absolutely. But we're not a licensed cannabis company anymore. So I currently have an account for the company at U.S. Bank with a credit card in my pocket. And because we're not a licensed cannabis company, we're an intellectual property company, I can wire money. I can wire to China for our packaging. It's amazing. I didn't used to be able to do that when I was a licensed cannabis business. Um, you know, we've got direct deposit for our employees now. That's amazing, too. Um, and I'm also not paying $3,000 a month to have those rights. So in Colorado, we had like two banks that would work with licensed companies. And it was either 5% of your top line sales per month, or it was a flat fee of $3,000 for the right to have a bank account. And then they would charge you based on how much cash they processed or counted. And the audit process was, I'm going to say, we just went through the audit for the CSC. And I used to do that quarterly for my bank to prove that my money wasn't from a criminal enterprise. So. Licensed cannabis businesses have opportunities, but they're very difficult because FinCEN put a laundry list of things that they must do in order to be compliant, and it's very expensive. But now that I'm an IP company, I don't have any of those problems. It's great to have a credit card. Awesome. We have a question from the webinar. Uh, how does the marketing responsibility fall between Can America and the licensee? That is an excellent question. We manage the marketing because we want to 
we want to handle the um, integrity of the brand. Plus, we're also well positioned with our experience to be able to navigate marketing based on restrictions of the state of who you can market to, how you market on the internet. Um, and you know that's the level of support that Can America provides to the licensee. Swag, social media, collateral that Frank builds for the menus, all of these types of things, those are all provided to the licensee as part of the per unit price. And typically, what we have is national marketing that we then all we have to do is tailor it to whatever the rules and the menu is for that individual state so it doesn't cost us a lot to do it um, I'm learning a lot about IR marketing and the kind of marketing you guys are used to it's just costing a lot more than cannabis marketing that's for sure because we can't we can only market to a specific group um, and we have to make sure that we're preventing marketing for anybody under the age of 21 and anybody who's from out of state. So we, when we're on the internet, we have to, you have to have all these drop-down questions. It's very difficult. There's lots of regulations around it, and we handle that for our licensee and promote their brands as well. So if you go to our social media, you'll see that in Nevada we're promoting Matrix NV. In Colorado, we're promoting. Uh, TR Scientific. In uh, Maryland, we're promoting FGM processing simply because we want them to experience the ability to be exposed to the consumers and not just a vehicle for Can America, which is very important. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.